Okay, welcome to another Orbiter 2010 video. And in this video, you can see here that I'm at uh, Carl Sagan Space Center, and I have the XR2 mounted to the HCLV. In this flight, we're simply going to go to Mars, and I've already taken care of most of the setup off camera. So this flight's going to be mostly, uh, mostly just about the execution. But what I wanted to kind of show here before we get started, let me actually switch camera views. I wanted to show a little bit about how I have the XR2 configured. So going back to uh, the spreadsheet that I showed in one of my other videos, you know, this is this is our rocket equation to let us know, you know, whether or not we're going to have enough fuel to complete the mission. And what I want to do in this flight is make the trip out to Mars, but I want to calculate the fuel cost so that I only have a 1% margin of error. In other words, if I burn too much fuel, then the, then the flight won't be successful. So our goal here is going to be just, be just simply going to be to go from Earth to Mars, and then we're going to use the atmosphere of Mars as a break, and then we'll you know, plan on doing some kind of runway type of landing. So this is the expert configuration of the XR2. So we have the, uh, the main fuel tank can only carry 50% uh, normal fuel capacity. And we're saying that we are going to include RCS as delta V, which means we very well may have to transfer fuel just to complete the just to complete the uh, injection burn. We're taking all 14 crew members, and I have the locks loadout set to zero. Uh, the default is one, and I put that note in here because last time I couldn't remember if it was one or zero. But in this configuration, we've got the locks loadout set to zero. I've already calculated that the mission duration is going to be 246 days. That that's given to us in Transex, and I've given myself a 10-day surplus of of locks. And the crew mass we already know. That's why it's blue. It's calculated, and this is how much locks we're going to require for uh, the 14 crew members. I've I've kind of reconfigured things a little bit, so I've it's not exactly the same as it was before. The uh, recommended locks loadout is given to us here. So for the for the internal tank, we need 100%. That's the you know that's the internal tank, and then we also need one full tank of locks, but it only needs to be filled to 61.2%. Uh, a half locks tank isn't quite enough, so I've already done that as well. And then for the so for cargo slot number one, I've got a full locks, and I've in here I've got the override. This is the you know this is the 61.2% basically. And then in cargo slot number two, I have a main fuel. But what's interesting about this is that the main fuel only needed to be about 20% full in order to uh, in order to get the DV that we needed. So I've drained I drained almost all the fuel, at least eight, about 80% of the fuel out of the out of the fuel module. And of course, we are taking the CHM, and the engine ISP is expert. So with this configuration. It gives us a total delta V starting, you know, from low Earth orbit of 3,682.85. And the cost of our injection burn is going to be 3,596.33, give or take a meter per second. So after the burn is done, we should have about 86 meters per second remaining. And then if we have zero mid-course corrections, we will gain an additional 26.63 meters uh, due to locks consumption. So in theory, uh, if our if everything goes absolutely perfect, we would arrive at Mars with about 113 meters per second of delta V remaining. Uh, let's take a look at our injection burn, see how we came up with that. Come over here to the spreadsheet. And this is the eject date. That's the, the date of arrival. That's how much prograde we're using. We're not using any outward. That's how much plane change we're using. And this is going to be our encounter velocity at Mars, so it's going to be a little bit faster than it was on one of the previous flights. So our total DV is here, but our the real cost, you know, what it's going to actually cost us to uh, do the injection burn, in other words, the TMI burn, that's this number here. That's 3,596.33. And then, of course, our orbit insert will be free because we're doing aero braking. And then... Uh, this number here is the total cost starting from low Earth orbit. That's the injection cost plus I, plus I figure 50 meters per second 
uh, worth of mid-course corrections, but most likely, most likely it'll be much lower than that because when we get up into orbit, we'll set up, we'll set up an IMFD plan to go to Mars, so it'll be much more accurate than TransX. Okay, so let's jump inside the ship here, and let's kind of just compare, make sure real quick that our numbers are saying according to. According to the XR2's ship mass calculator, we have uh, 36,600 kg, and according to our spreadsheet, we are 36,600 kg, so that matches perfectly. Therefore, we know that our uh, delta V calculation is correct. So we're ready to go here. I've already got, like I said, I already got the transex plan set up, so uh, let's get underway. Going to bring up the uh, larger view here, and actually let me switch over to the HCLV since we're going to be launching from it. And we'll have to go back on this side and we'll have to inherit the plan. Now let's bring up launch MFD on this side. There, uh, There's a new, uh, there's a feature of launch MFD, it's not new. There's a feature of launch MFD that I recently found out about that I did not know it had. If you have your escape plan open on this side and you have launch MFD open over here, what we can do, what we want to do when we launch from Earth, we always want to have a heading under ideal circumstances as close to 90 degrees as possible. Now, TransX doesn't tell you when you're going to reach a 90 degree heading. You can see currently we're really close to 90 degrees, but we are technically one day prior to the escape. Uh, to our eject date. If we come over here to stage two and look at our eject date, we can see that our eject date is actually about one day from now. I always set my plans up like that where I have, you know, about a 24 hour window before launch. That way I can find that 90 degree heading. So right now, I mean, it would be a good time to take off because we have an almost a 90 degree heading, but we're technically one day early. So what we want to do is we want to find out when the next opportunity is going to be to take off with a 90 degree heading. And again, Transex doesn't tell you that, so the only way you can find out is to warp time forward and then, you know, do your eject orientation adjustments until you're until you find 90. It turns out that you can actually get that information uh, using launch MFD and I didn't know this until very recently. But if you press a uh, target and then it gives you this fairly complex string of things that you can put in what we want to put in is the uh, the inclination, which is given to us here, so 23.22, then space. Then we want the longitude of the ascending node, which is 175.8. Then you have to press space and then the letter C in order to match the format. So inclination, longitude of the ascending node, and then C, and that's the ecliptic frame. That's what we want. Target selected. So now when we hit enter, we can see that we will have a heading that's really close to 90 degrees. You know, if we go technically north, it'll be 88.6. And if we go technically south, it'll be 91.4. But basically, it will be 90 degrees. And that's going to come up in 57,408 seconds. And we know that one day on Earth is about 86,400 seconds. So we are going to reach that time before a 24-hour period passes. And remember, remember this date here, 58257, is, is about one day before launch. So we want to at least fast forward time to this point. So let's go ahead and do that now. And we can probably go a little faster. Be a little careful on the time warp. You know, it can get away from you fairly quickly. So now we're getting down to 6,000, 5,000, and so on. And what we want to do is we want to look at this time. Let's go when we're about 10 minutes. Okay, let's look at this time. So in, in about 10 minutes, it's going to be time to launch and we'll have our, we'll have the desired heading of about 90 degrees. But we can see here 58257.6 is still about uh, not quite a half day away. So what we can do is we can, uh, we can see if the next launch opportunity will be better. Now, you might want to save at this point, like do a control S and save and then come back because there's really, I don't think there's really any way to know if the next launch heading 
will be better, or rather I should say if the next launch time will be better than the one we currently have. I actually know, uh, just because I tested this out prior, that the very next launch heading is actually going to be much closer to our, is going to be much closer to our eject date, so we're going to take that. But I don't know that there's any way to know that, so when you get really close to the time to intersection, you might want to do a control S and then see if the next launch opportunity is even better. So let's go ahead and go forward. And I'll show you what I mean here when we get down to zero seconds. Okay, now that we're down to, you know, basically zero and, and now it's now it's giving us the time to intersection for the next launch opportunity. And the next launch opportunity is just 26,500 seconds away. And that's going to work out to put us really close to this exact eject date. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect, but the closer you are to this eject date, uh, the better off you're going to be when you get up into orbit your, and set up your maneuvers and everything. It's going to be more, it's going to be more closely matched to what your plan was when you were on the ground. So let's go around to the next opportunity. And one thing to mention too, pay attention to these numbers here, northern and southern. When you get really close to the launch opportunity, these numbers are going to change rapidly. So you want to know you want to know what they are now. And we're going to say, you know, 91.4 is the one that we're going to take. But you'll see when we get down to, you know, 500 seconds or something that these numbers will start, you know, becoming basically like real time. Warping time forward at 1,000, be care being careful not to overshoot. And we still have one more little bit of setup to do before we launch, but it's easy. We just have to set up the uh, the autopilot launcher. Okay, so now we're down to just 1,000 seconds. Oh, there we go. And you can see what I'm talking about here. When you get down, I don't know what the number was, 800 seconds or whatever, but this number starts to change. So if you, if you don't remember what it was before, then I don't know that there's any way to tell uh, to tell what you need. Now I'm guessing, this is a bit of guesswork on my part, but I'm guessing again that we want to launch when we're just about, uh, you know, halfway, you know, until we reach half orbital velocity. Now on the Del Delta Glider and XR2, that would normally be about 300 seconds, but the HCLV accelerates much faster, I've noticed, so we we can probably wait till the time to intersection is about 200 seconds. So on this side, I'm going to bring up the Hyperion control, and we're going to put in a target APA of 200 kilometers, and we'll go ahead and leave the heading set for, well, let's maybe be more precise with it, 91.4, I believe is what it was, and then when we get to uh, 200 seconds prior to launch, we'll will enable the uh, autopilot and get get underway. Good warp time four to get closer to the time to intersection. And coming up here shortly, this like right about right about here, somewhere between 300 and 320 seconds, would be the normal time that you would want to take off if using you know the XR2 or Delta glider but again I've noticed that the that the high, that the HCLV just has much more acceleration so it gets up to orbital velocity quite a bit faster I think it, I think I even have some notes somewhere where I wrote down what the time to intersection should be but I I forgot I don't remember I'd have to look it up but I remember it was like it was under 250 So we'll go at 210, and we're off. Let's uh, bring up the HUD here, change colors to something we can see. The beautiful HCLV by LaRue, this is an amazing launcher, I absolutely love this thing. It's my new favorite way to get the XR2 to orbit.
go ahead and switch HUD colors now. Maybe we can see the green now, we can. All right, now let's bring up uh, Transex, actually, so we can keep track of our relative inclination difference. And it's currently going up, that's the problem, so let's put in a different heading. Actually, before I do that, let me adjust the eject orientation a little bit. Yeah, it's possible that it would go up and go back down, but let's, uh, let's see if we can put in a different heading here to compensate or to correct for that relative inclination. So maybe instead of 91.4, I should have put in exactly 90. And if we want, we can also bring up a line plane MFD and we can put in that information. 23.09 space 176 and then we can keep track of our time to node so yeah actually 90 isn't going to be quite right because we can see the time to node we're at the node now so let's go to 91 So it'll kind of top out here, then it'll go back down. Which I think is about what we want, because we want to have half, half our ride to orbit, you know, kind of going toward the node, and then the other half kind of away from it. Boosters have already separated. There they are back there. And we passed the node. So I kind of didn't do that exactly right. So now we'll put in some correction to bring down the relative inclination. Because we're already at half orbital velocity. But you can see just how much acceleration this has. You know, that's, uh, what is that, 3G worth of acceleration? Because I can bring up load MFD and find out. Yeah, it's 3.4G, which you currently can't see, but I can move the cam down. Now you can see it. Let's bring back up the Hyperion Control. And I would say we probably want a little more heading correction. So I think instead of the 91.4 that I put in, I probably wanted the other one, the 89.6, I think it was, or 88.6. But we're getting close to being in plane, and we're almost at orbital velocity. So hopefully these will time out so I don't have to do any more heading adjustments. If we can get it down to less than 0.5, then that's pretty good. Eh, not too bad. Okay, now let me... Uh, take note of what we have to do yet. Okay, we are here in our orbit and we're going to come around to this point and eject out. So we're going to reach Apoapsis first. Let's go ahead and bring up Orbit MFD. Change the projection, change the distance readout and set the frame to equatorial or rather equator. Yeah, equatorial. And since we need to reach Apoapsis and circularize, we'll go ahead and just fast forward time here and let that happen. But before I do that, since we are now in orbit, let me switch over to the XR2 and open the radiator before I forget. So turn on the APU. Not 
the air break the radiator. A little bit of time warp to speed that up. And the radiator is deployed, so we don't have to worry about the XR2 overheating as happened in one of my other missions. Okay, let me start load MFD also. And I guess we can go ahead and leave that G meter up. It'll be interesting maybe to see what our G is when we uh, when we do the ejection burn. Okay, the Hyperion Control autopilot's still running, and it's just waiting to circularize our orbit. And we're only 323 seconds away, so let's time warp over to Apoapsis. Go a little faster than that. And we'll go back to real time. I don't know how well the Hyperion Control Autopilot handles time warp, so we'll let we'll let it play out at real time here for the circularization. And there's the circularization burn. See how well the autopilot handles that as far as getting our APA and PEA correctly set. Eh, pretty accurate. It's a little bit off, but I don't think you can really blame the autopilot because we have non-spherical gravity sources enabled. So these typically are a bit off. Okay, so we are done with the Hyperion Control. Uh, we're done with the HCLV. The next order of business will be to uh, do the Trans Mars Injection Burn. Now, I can't ever remember the keyboard command to uh, detach the XR2, but if you press PLD, that will do it for you. Actually, I guess you can press menu. I was going to say it would probably tell you the keyboard shortcut, but I don't see it there. But if you press uh, PLD, like it says here, that's the separate payload. So, detach. And now the HCLV has uh, like four, meet, 4 kilometers per second left. Yeah, 4.3 kilometers per second left. So, you know, we could use, uh, with, the, with the XR2 still attached, it's more like 2,800 um, so in, in theory, we could actually use all that Delta V to, uh, to go to help us with our trans Mars injection burn. But there's a, there's a reason I don't want to do that. And that's just for the calculation sake. I want to, I want to do all the calculations in the spreadsheet and just see how accurate, how accurate I can be. Okay. So that's done. Let's uh, control F3 over to the XR2. And according to the XR2, we have uh, 2,819 meters per second, which isn't even enough to do our burn. And in this case, uh, let's see, we, we, what we can do now is we can actually transfer the RCS over to the main since we do have a little bit of that payload. You know, we basically we can transfer RCS into the payload tank instead of waiting until we start the burn. So let's do that now. Cross speed. And this is necessary because uh, we don't have the DV otherwise to make to do the uh, to do the Trans Mars injection burn. waiting for, let me do a little bit of time warp to speed that up. And we'll get down to like 5% to RCS. Warning. RCS system reset. Go with that. Now let's see. Okay, we may have, we may, we may be ending the mission right now because according to burn time calculator, we've only got 2,819 actually I, f I keep forgetting this doesn't take into account the payload fuel, so I have to get how much mass we have in the payload. 
Okay, we have 21, 13.29. But I think we have to take off the, the mass of the vessel, or the mass of the... Uh, of the tank itself. So but let's start with that 21, 13, 29. And I'm going to go down to 0 0.1 X for a minute because I'm not sure how close I am to the time to do the burn. All right, we still got a quarter of an hour, but we're fine. Okay, so that says we have 3,841. Let me compare that to what my spreadsheet said we would have. Okay, my spreadsheet says we would have 3,682. So what we have to do is we also, we, in that, uh, this includes the mass of the tank itself so we have to subtract the mass of the tank so we'll just bring up a calculator windows calculator is fine 2113.29 minus and i forget the mass of those tanks i'll have to look it up 355.20 so minus 355.2 so this is actually how much fuel we have in that tank. So 1758.09. Okay, now we have 3,663 meters per second. And we calculated that we would have 3,682. So that's really close. Well, we actually still have some mass from the RCS as well, so let's not forget to add that in. So, uh, man, I forgot what I said that number was. So we have, I'm going to have to look again, sorry. 21, 13.29 minus 355.2 plus the RCS that we still have left. And that's 39.9, so 1797.99. And that gives us 3,683, and our spreadsheet said it would be 3,683 if you round up that decimal point, then we'd have 3,683. Again, it's lovely to see that things come together so accurately. Okay, now, uh, now since I'm coming up to uh, 30 minutes on this part of the video, I'm gonna go ahead and stop it here. And I'll actually do a, uh, before I do that though, Let's translate away Rotation, translation. just a little bit so we can get some separation between us and the HCLV, more separation. And that'll be fine. Okay, so let me go ahead and control S to save here. And when we come back, we'll pick up right here at this point, And then we'll set up our plan for actually doing the burn to go out to Mars. And we'll probably... Uh, well, we would definitely will be using IMFD to do that. If you like this part of the video, please hit the like button down below. If you didn't like it, hit the don't like button. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed and you like all this space stuff. Links are in the description, and I will see you in the next video.